Now, uh, now I'm delighted to be joined by the Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland, Michelle O'Neill. Now, Northern Ireland has become uh, the first one of the nations within the UK to go for what looks like a sort of reasonably tough national lockdown, a sort of circuit break. And Michelle, if I could start by asking you, I mean, the Prime Minister said today in the House of Commons that he regarded that kind of circuit break as a disaster, but you beg to differ. What, 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 why, does it, why, why does it work for you? Well, firstly, good evening. Um, I think we find ourselves in a position which we wish we weren't. Um, the rates of uh, transmission are actually rising exponentially to the point where we're probably now are probably the worst in Europe, in the north of Ireland. So that's a very worrying position that we find ourselves in. So it was very clear to us that what we needed to do was have immediate intervention. Uh, I'm delighted to say that we have been able to find a way forward, and that's no mean feat whenever you have five parties around mm. at the government table. Um, but we have found a way forward. We've brought in what, I mean, some would describe as a circuit breaker, um, a number of measures which we think will bring the transmission down. Um, we have to do this. We have no other option. It's very, very difficult, very challenging, no doubt. But... It's the right thing to do. Um, and I know that many people tonight will be sitting um, very worried about their futures, you know, their, their employment prospect, everything else that goes along with bringing in measures like this. But it's absolutely necessary for us to do this. Now, one of the things that was very striking about your measures is you are shutting schools for a couple of weeks and, and, and one week of that is not half term holiday. Um, Politicians have, and, and scientists indeed, have argued that schools are not the problem. What, why did you feel you had to do that? Well, I suppose, uh, if I set out the objective, our R rate is sitting now at about 1.5. We're trying to get that down to 0.7, mm. suppress the virus for as long as possible to hopefully get us into the new year. Um, so that's why we brought forward the cocktail of measures. So you're right, we have moved on schools. And the reason we did that was because we believe schools and hospitality together. So hospitality is completely been shut down so there's no more of this you can have you know you can have a pint with a burger and then you can you know that the virus won't spread all this sort of nonsense <laughs> that you referred to earlier on we're trying to get make this as very simple and clear for people to understand as possible so we've taken this measure with a heavy heart to shut down all of the hospitality sector that along with the schools we believe will bring or down to one and then we've brought forward a number of other measures which we believe the cumulative effect of that will be at, uh, in four weeks time that we should hopefully get to 0.7 that's the objective, and um, I suppose the four weeks will, ahead will tell if that's the case. We do believe that if we do this um, and everybody complies and works with us, that we can get to that point. And I do believe there's been a rude awakening again for the people here that um, in the past two days, 11 people have died. We've increased hospital admissions mm. and we're only probably 10 days away from our hospitals being overrun. Um, Michelle, as you be aware there's tons more I want to ask you so if you could just stay with us for a few minutes and all of you if you could stay uh, with us because obviously all of this matters to all of us so uh, see you after the break. Welcome back I'm delighted that Michelle O'Neill the Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland is still with me. Um, Michelle we're talking about the measures that you have announced today to really bear down on the virus in Northern Ireland. Now, one of the arguments that people make against the kind of pretty comprehensive lockdown that you've uh, announced is, what do you do if after the four weeks that you've set for this, actually transmission of the virus is still too high? Does it just roll on? What, what happens then if, if it hasn't worked in the way that you want it to work? Well, I mean, I think the only thing we can base our approach on is what we did in March. So we're, we know that in March, whenever the pandemic hit, the hour rate got to 2.8. We know that the interventions we made at that time made a huge difference and brought us down to 0.7 to mm. 0.9. So I think if you take that as your example, we're hopeful that we, we can make this work. We're hopeful that we can get down to 0.7 again. But if we don't, we obviously have to rethink. Um, I think the difference between now and what we're doing is a targeted intervention for a set period of time. When we went into lockdown back in March, that was something that was reviewed on an ongoing basis. Mm. I think we needed to give, in this period, I think we've, what we've tried to do is to say to people, work with us and we can get there, we can get back down again if you work with us. And I think that's the, the message. It's more of a, of a let's help each other to, to get to the other, the other side of this. And, and I think that the people here, as I said earlier, are, are certainly very alert to the fact that we're now in a very grave situation. Now, obviously, this will damage quite a lot of businesses, employment prospects. What are you planning to do to help those businesses and help people to feel confident that their jobs will still be there at the end of this? 
Yeah, I mean, as a political leader, I, I wish I didn't have to take the decisions that we have um, had to take. But in all of this, we're trying to get a balance. You know, a healthy population leads to a healthy economy and vice versa. Um, I think the challenge for us as an executive is, is, is twofold. Uh, one, as obviously because um, we don't have a lot of fiscal powers because uh, that's um, um, held in Westminster. I think that the folly of partition has been um, very much highlighted over the pandemic. Um, so we don't have the ability as an executive to do a lot of the, the response that we would want to do ourselves. And there's some things that are within our gifts. So we're bringing forward a number of support packages to, to support um, businesses to keep afloat. We've um, provided a rates holiday for all businesses, which is very significant, obviously, in terms of overheads. But what I'm really concerned about right now is the support that we can provide to those people that need to self-isolate. Mm. I am constantly speaking to people who tell me they cannot afford to self-isolate. Now, that's an indictment on society. So what we're looking at is the types of supports that we can do uh, to, to give those people some comfort. And alongside that, um, what the, very, the at the heart of supporting workers right now is this job um, the support scheme, which provides for two-thirds of your wage. But if you're someone who works on a minimum wage and you're being given two-thirds of that wage, that's not a, a very good situation for anybody to find themselves in, particularly in the mouth of Christmas. So I'm very much putting it up to um, Boris Johnson that um, if he wants to help this executive respond to this crisis and get things under control, then we need the financial wherewithal to be able to do that also. Now, we're almost out of time, unfortunately. A couple of very quick questions. You've heard from the First Minister of Wales that he has introduced a ban on people from high infection areas in England going to Wales. Are you likely to do the same thing in, in Northern Ireland? Well, I mean, I've, I've listened to what Mark um, has done. He actually has written a letter to myself and to Arlene Foster. I mean, I agree. I, I've actually been raising this issue for some time. I think the issue of travel does need to be resolved. If it was in my gift, then certainly that would be something that I would absolutely do. Um, but our situation is that we have five parties around the executive table, so five parties in government together, and get a political agreement to do something like that would obviously be very difficult. Um, but certainly in my mind, the travel restrictions are a vital part um, of our fight back against COVID. And I absolutely accept that Wales have a very different, uh, insofar as they share a land border, uh, we are different in that we are the island of Ireland. And now, we are almost out of time. Unfortunately, I've said what, what is almost the hardest question to last. Um, you mentioned yourself that you've got, in some parts of Northern Ireland, the highest rates of the virus anywhere in Europe. I think Derry has got a particular problem. Um, why do you think the rates of infection are so high in Northern Ireland? Isn't it strange that we find ourselves from being the exemplar? Actually, people were looking at us as the good practice model, but then over the course of a number of weeks, we find ourselves with this exponential rise in cases. Mm. There's no one big bang thing that we can point to. Um, it appears to be widespread community transmission. All the contact tracing is not throwing up, you know, any sort of big area or mm. we can definitely point to as the reason. So um, that's all have to be analysed over, over the course of, of the weeks ahead. But clearly we have a, a very, very difficult situation on our hands. Um, I believe that we have led the way today in so far as being finding an accommodation of, across five parties guided by the public health advice as, as an intervention, and this is the most needed intervention. Listen, as always, it's absolutely a, a, a delight to have you on the programme, and we hope you'll come back soon. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Robert.